analysts out here, and we'd like to start with Peter. So, uh, so Peter is a professor of education and health at University of New South Wales in Australia. He's also the editor of international journals such as Sex Education and Cultural Health and Sexuality and has worked internationally on sexual health for more than 25 years. He has also assisted in development of UNESCO's technical guidance on sexual, sexuality education. I think everyone of us know. So uh, let's uh, give the floor to Peter. So all the panelists will have 10 minutes. And uh, after we finish all the panelists, then we'll go for the questions. So all the panelists will have 10 minutes. So I will like, uh, I will give a signal after 10 minutes to, to sleep. Did you say 12 up. minutes, Sangeet? Yeah, no, so <laughs> each of you have like 10 minutes. So I'll give like a sign after right. 10 minutes to conclude your points. All right, thank you very much indeed. Um, and I'd like to thank the conference organizers for inviting uh, me to speak this morning. Um, what I want to do in the course of 10 or 12 minutes is to share what we've learned about sex and relationships education over the last 20 years, to offer some thoughts about where we might go from here, um, and hopefully to deal with this microphone which has now got um, an echo in it. Can with the sound system people try to do something with this humming noise, please? Thank you. I think we need to recognize, all of us, we all do, I think, that education about sex and relationships is a difficult thing um, in certain respects. It can be done, but it, it's tricky. Um, and indeed, what we call it indicates something of the trickiness. Um, in the UK, where I used to work and live, we used to call it sex and relationships education. In the Republic of Ireland, um, just across the sea, we called it relationship and sex education. We put the relationships first. In the Netherlands and parts of continental Europe, it's been called sexuality education. In some parts of the world, it's sexuality is plural education. All of this terminology, I think, indicates some of the complexities that, that face us. Is it possible to do anything about this humming noise? the challenge of being the first speaker. Um, so I was just saying something about the, the complexities of what we have to deal with. And I think another complexity is introduced by the fact that not many of us have experienced good quality sex and relationships education ourselves. I wanted us to begin, could you just raise your hand if you believe you did receive good quality sex and relationships education yourself? One, two, three. Three or four people out of all of us this morning indicate that they received good quality sex and relationships education. I think we've got a lot of catching up to do, haven't we, in that respect. If here at a major international conference on sexual reproductive health, only a few of us can say we actually received it. I hope many more of us could say, I won't ask this next question, but I hope many more of us could say that we are involved in delivering it now. So where are we now? I think increasingly the importance of this is recognized. We've seen it being endorsed by a whole range of international agencies. We've seen a number of national governments endorsing the importance, at least in theory and on paper, of good quality relationships and sex education. But debate still exists. And there are various areas of debate which I don't think we can ignore if we want to make progress. First, I think there's major debate about the form that this education should take. Should it, for example, stress abstinence or should it be more comprehensive? I'm not sure that really in reality there are many forms of very comprehensive sexuality and relationships education, but perhaps I'll come back to that later. When should it begin? A lot of debate about should it begin really early on in life, in the primary age, or should it be delayed until just before marriage? Who should provide it? 
enormous debate about whether this is the responsibilities of parents, of teachers, or of health promotion workers, or doctors, and so on. And what are the key messages that should be promoted? Much debate, isn't there, about where should biology be, where should relationships be, and where should gender and sexual diversity be, if mentioned at all. And of course, something that isn't so much overtly debated within our communities, but is debated in the world outside, how do we strike a balance between science and morality? Or where do moral values come into our work on sex and relationships education, if at all? So, as I said earlier, our own experiences of this are perhaps not a very good starting point. In my family, I was taught nothing by my mother or my father about sex and relationships. In fact, I was brought up in a family where there was a sense of embarrassment and silence. Sex was regarded as something dirty, smutty, not something that a young man like me should learn about. The same was true at school. We learned about cockroaches' reproduction, or at least we looked at pictures of their reproductive systems. We did the same with rats, and we did the same with frogs. But never did the two pictures come together. They were always on separate pages of the textbook. And once again, I learned relatively little about how sex and relationships actually took place. Again, I think that's probably the experience of many of us in this room, and I fear it is the experience of many young people still growing up today. What have we learned? I used to work for the World Health Organization in the early 1990s. I was chief of social and behavioral research within the global program on AIDS. I was one of the youngest members of staff, and the day I arrived in the office, I had a task to do. My boss at the time told me, look, we have a lot of problems in some countries of this world where policymakers and politicians insist that the more we talk about sex, the more young people will do it. So therefore, we mustn't talk about it at all. Can you bring together the evidence that talking about sex or doing sex education actually has perhaps a beneficial effect? So we commissioned this study way back in 1993. Another study in 1993, later on that same year, looking at a larger number of reports trying to find out what it is, if anything, that sex and relationships education produced, and a later update for UNAIDS in 1997. And as you can see, more and more articles got included, but the messages, the basic messages, remain the same. That is that good quality sex and relationships education, or sexuality education, and the different papers call it different things, did, on the whole, have extremely beneficial effects, not the negative effects that were feared. Having said that, this is scientific evidence, and some people are not convinced by scientific evidence. They want a moral position in order to argue the case from. Douglas Kirby, who passed away just a few years ago, um, spent a lot of his life actually updating um, those studies. Um, he, before, he, before he passed on, he, he, I was actually reviewing 83 of the studies. But he was particularly interested in what were the qualities, the key features, in a sense, of this good quality sex and relationships education that could produce the beneficial effects. And here are just some of them. Importantly, I think, that the best programs involve or are designed by or have input from people who are expert in this field. But notice not just experts in sexuality, but experts in teaching and learning. And one of the problems I think we faced in this field is that we haven't had enough experts in teaching and learning, in other words, the educational focus, in a lot of our work to date. The information provided needs to be scientifically accurate, understandable. That's a bit of a challenge, isn't it, for some of the books that I've looked at, and certainly some of the teacher's guides, which even I can't understand, but never mind, leave that on one side. Unambiguous, culturally relevant, and gender and sexuality sensitive. Well, quite a list. By the time uh, Doug had finished his work, by the way, he had actually got 12 items on this list. Students need to feel safe. Um, if sexuality education takes place in a context where people are anxious or fearful, it doesn't tend to work as well as it does in circumstances where people feel safe. Two or three more here. Needs to begin early on. I think the evidence is fairly clear that the earlier you begin, and most certainly before people begin sexual relationships, the, the education has the most beneficial effects. It needs to address biology but it also needs to address relationships. Um, we can't do one, we can't do the other by itself. We have to do them together with some other things. 
values and attitudes and feelings need to be engaged with, we need to recognize that sex and relationships engage our emotions, they engage our feelings. And that's sometimes quite difficult for teachers to do, depending on the context they're working in, where feelings are somehow to be excluded from the classroom and the focus is only to be on the knowledge which is being passed on, the skills that are being acquired and so on. And young people need to be presented, I think adults also need to be presented, with a menu of options from which they can choose depending on where they are, what kind of relationship they're in, and so on and so forth. If we look back at our own sexual histories, we would probably be able to identify that the forms of sexual relationship we enjoy today are not necessarily the same that we enjoyed 20 or 30 years ago, and those were perhaps not the same as our first relationships. So the crucial thing really is to focus upon sexuality and sexual health education across a menu of options that might be relevant at different moments in life. Some of the issues that I suspect other panel members will come back to later on is the need for skilled and motivated teachers. Most people go into teaching not to teach about sex and relationships, not to teach about drugs. Those who teach younger children often want to teach children. And those who teach older children often want to teach, unusually, not children, but subjects. <laughs> They're perhaps passionate about mathematics, or science, or language, or whatever, but none of the teachers, in fact, I don't think I've really ever met a single teacher, and I used to be working in teacher education, who said, the reason I want to go into teaching is to teach young people about sex and relationships. This creates an enormous problem for our work because we're always coming to catch up in a sense, and we're having to work with those few teachers, perhaps, who are keen to do this and who are keen to acquire the skills in order to do it well. Perhaps one other point just worth stressing is this linkage, the last point here, between school programs and sexual and reproductive health services. Too much of the world exists in parallel tracks, doesn't it? There's the education sector on the one hand, there's the health sector on the other hand, and relatively infrequently do we get the crossover to make them work together. Some of the most successful initiatives that I've seen in the world involve bringing sexual health services into schools, not expecting people, young people or teachers or other adults to go out of the school and find the sexual health service in a different context. But I really wanted just to finalize by, I suppose, a, a number of other issues that, 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 that are, are crucial. And these, I think, there are three of them I want to stress as challenges for the future. The first of them is about political commitment. Unless we have a real commitment at different levels of politics to making this work, I don't think we're going to be successful as we go forward. And what I mean by political commitment is political commitment from politicians Crucially also from administrators, the heads, for example, of education departments in local authorities and in countries. Often, in my experience, I found these to be relatively conservative people, people whose own backgrounds is perhaps not as broad as it, as mu as it might be in certain respects. Don't get me wrong, they're hardworking people on the whole. They want to do the right thing, but perhaps they're not often as politically committed to these things as they need to be. The second thing I really wanted to stress was the importance of teacher education, good quality education for all teachers, because in a sense you never know the teacher who's going to be approached. It won't necessarily be the specialist or the teacher that's got sex and relationships education after their name. Young people and children in schools go to the teacher they trust, and they might be the teacher of mathematics or of science, they might be the teacher of language or anything else. So all teachers in a sense need some form of preparation. But specialist teachers, probably many of the teachers that we here work with, need more than that. And getting that balance right is really crucial. And the third but most important area, I think, at this moment in time is about dealing with gender and sexual diversity. You know, all over the world and throughout history, we've known that this exists in every society in the world. Too often we've turned a blind eye, we've pretended it's not there. Many politicians and policy makers continue to do that now. But there's a clear evidence of increasing complexity in the way young people in particular are uh, understanding themselves and their relationships with others. You've only got to look at the social media, for example, to look at some of these instances of increasing gender and sexual diversity. On dating sites and in other social um, media environments, young people or adults as well are 
invited to identify themselves using a range of different characteristics here. Many of them, I hope, perhaps all of them will be familiar to you. No, I doubt it, actually. There are probably things there that you'd like to say, what is that? But these are the new forms of identification which are emerging very rapidly at the moment, and which teachers, which educators, which health experts of the future, which people who want to do good will have to engage with if we're going to do this work really well. Uh, I would like to request to conclude the presentation. Thank you.